You may have noticed that justice has become a bit of a, a buzzword in our world today. It seems like everywhere you look, someone's talking about criminal justice, democratic justice, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, food justice, etc. Uh, a Google search of the word justice last week produced these top headlines. Tens of thousands rally to demand justice after Greek train crash. New study raises environmental justice concerns uh, over trash import bans. Iranian unions and civil rights groups demand democracy and social justice. A charter on food justice is being rewritten by Guelph Community Group. First Nations leaders gather to learn about indigenous justice. International Conference on Justice concludes in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Now, this interest in justice is understandable for Christians because we know that it is part of God's law. And according to Romans 2.15, God's law is written on the human heart. The conscience longing for wrongs to be righted in this fallen and often unjust world. Yet for those who have received God's law in the written revelation of God's word, that longing for justice is even stronger. Because we know just how far we have fallen. The objective standard of justice in our hands exposing the full extent of injustice in our communities, in our nation, in our world, which so often goes unchecked, unpunished, and overlooked. Like the 74,000 babies legally murdered in Canada every year by abortion. Or the 4 million plus victims of human trafficking around the world that no one seems to be talking about. Or the 360 million Christians who face high levels of discrimination and persecution increasingly around the world today. All these injustices and so many more trouble we who know the full extent of God's law. It troubles us greatly, and and maybe it causes some to wonder, why is God allowing all of these injustices to happen? Does he even care? Is he even there? Well, as we continue to work our way through the book of Esther this morning, coming to chapter 7, it will be demonstrated here through an incredible turn of events that when God's people long for justice in this often ungodly world, God is there. He's working behind the scenes to achieve his perfect purposes, just like we've seen throughout the story so far. God's hidden hand of providence is orchestrating everything according to his plans, which we'll now see includes executing justice and judgment on the wicked in the end. You'll remember that the the driving plot line of the story has been the coming annihilation of the Jews, a genocidal plan masterminded by Haman, the Agagite, an enemy of the Jews. In the first chapters, it looked like nothing could stop this Holocaust from happening. But now there's hope. As Mordecai the Jew was unexpectedly honored, you'll remember, in chapter 6, And Queen Esther, also a Jew, now has the attention and favor of the king as we come to chapter 7. So will Haman's evil now be exposed? Will he finally pay for his crimes? Will justice be served? We find out now as the chapter begins. First of all, by recording in in, in verses 1 to 6, how wicked Haman was justly discovered by the king. So starting in verse 1, we read, So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. So you'll remember this is the second private feast that Queen Esther threw for the king and Haman. The first feast ended in chapter 5, you'll remember, with the king's agreement to attend the next feast feast and to give the queen at that feast whatever she asks. Well, now it says the second day has come, the second feast, and it was finally time for Esther to plead for the lives of her threatened people. So we read in verse three and four, then Queen Esther answered, 
If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. For the first time in the story, Esther publicly identifies with her people, with God's people. In fact, did you notice she went further? She tied their fates together. My life, she says, and my people. And this was a real risk. Because if things didn't turn out in the Jews' favor in the end, if the king refused to do anything about Haman's devious plan for their destruction, she could very well be destroyed with them. But that was a risk she was willing to take. Another example of what we saw a few weeks ago about doing the right thing even when the results are not guaranteed. And yet the queen, she wasn't careless about how she went about this either. No, she was very careful and very clever. She used, we might say, good psychology here. Notice, first, she focused on what would please the king, so it didn't look like she was imposing her will on him. Then she used the exact same words that the king had used, wish and request, in order to show who's really in charge. It was her, or sorry, it was him. Uh, then she emphasized that her life was in danger, and surely the king is, wanna, is gonna wanna save the life of his queen. And then finally, she expressed the seriousness of the matter by astonishingly telling the king, you know, if we'd only been sold as slaves, I wouldn't have bothered you. But this is a matter of our survival. Also notice how Esther does everything she can to minimize the king's blame. Recognizing that her and her people had been sold, referring to Haman's bribe in chapter three, while never revealing that it was the king they were sold to. He had received the bribe, allowing the Jews to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated, the very same words that Haman had used in chapter 313. And so we might say that Esther was being as shrewd as a serpent and innocent as a dove, just as Jesus would say later in Matthew 10. Well, Esther's tactics and tactfulness seemed to work because Ahasuerus responded in verse five exactly as she hoped. Who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? In the Hebrew, the king used six monosyllabic words and when they're pronounced together, it, it sounds kind of like a machine gun fire. Maybe it would be something like, someone better tell me who did this and tell me now which provided the opportunity that Esther had been waiting for to drop that bomb that we have been waiting for all along in verse six. A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Ever since Haman's Holocaust had been arranged, authorized, and announced in chapter three, the reader's been longing for justice, hoping that he'll get caught, hoping he'll finally get what's coming to him. And we probably expected it, maybe because we'd read the book before, but maybe also because we just know that this is so often what occurs. Cain's murder of Abel in Genesis 4, Moses' murder of an Egyptian in Exodus 3, David's adultery and murderous cover-up, cover up, excuse me, in 2 Samuel 12, uh, Ananias and Sapphira's deception in Acts 5. These wicked devices and deeds were all discovered in the end because this is just generally how the world works. As Numbers 32.23 warns, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, it may seem at times like many are getting away with murder, but more often than not, they are caught. Just think of all of the recent public scandals just in the last few years that have rocked governments and businesses and sports and churches, etc. People think that they, can con uh, that they can conceal their evil, but inevitably, it is discovered, just as it was here in the story. 
which gets even more interesting and intense as it goes on now to record how wicked Haman was justly dismayed before the king. So middle of verse six, then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen, or he grew pale, as the New Living Translation puts it. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. What a scene that would have been. Just imagine being one of the many servants who would have been standing there watching this whole thing, watching the, most sec- the second most uh, powerful and prosperous and prominent man in the entire Persian empire who yesterday was strutting around like a peacock having risen to the very top, now terrified and falling before the queen. And why wouldn't he? Haman knew his life was on the line. He had seen the king's wrath at work before. And so it's just a matter of time before he gets what's coming to him. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, Proverbs 16, 14 says. And the terror of a king is like the growling of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger forfeits his life, Proverbs 22. That's exactly what we're seeing happen right here. And oh, how the tables have turned. And oh, how the mighty have fallen. Haman, the enemy of the Jews, now finds himself bowing before a Jew and begging for his life. Just adding further humiliation to what he endured the day before. You'll remember when he was parading around Mordecai in honor around the city. The very one who had refused to honor him earlier and why he had built this giant execution stake in the first place. The poetic justice here is perfect. Every detail of what happens next is just brimming with brilliant irony. But this comical turn of events, it also reveals for us generally what happens to the hateful and haughty of this world. The scripture tells us over and over again that those who try to build themselves up will inevitably be brought down, piercing themselves with the own penalties of their pride. Think of Pharaoh who was struck with plagues, whose son was killed by the angel of death and whose army was drowned in the Red Sea in Exodus 7 to 14 because he had exalted himself against God and against God's people. Or think of Herod in the New Testament who was struck down by an angel and eaten up by worms in Acts 12 because he wouldn't give God the glory when the people of Tyre and Sidon were worshiping him. Just like Haman, this demonstrates the biblical truth that we see, for example, in Proverbs 16, that everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Those truths should really have each of us question ourselves, examine ourselves. Are you and I arrogant in any way? Are we proud? Are we conceited? Are we haughty? Well, according to the Bible, that is a very dangerous place to be. Like Haman, we're living on the edge of a devastating fall. And that should be a warning to us all. It's been said that at the height of Napoleon's success, just prior to his Russian campaign, the French commander was detailing his battle plans to a noble lady with such arrogance that she challenged him by saying, sir, remember, man proposes, but God disposes. To which he replied, Madame, I propose and I dispose too. I make circumstances. Well, a few months later, Napoleon was in full retreat the beginning of his mighty fall, later losing not only further battles, but his crown, his army, his liberty, and his own life. 
And history could give countless more examples of proud and powerful people who flew high on the wings of their arrogant ambition only to be brought low by the justice of God. And Haman's among them, dismayed before the king who's determined, it says, to do him harm. Which takes us now to the final scene of the chapter that records for us in verses eight to 10 how wicked Haman was justly destroyed because of the king. So verse eight says, and the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered up Haman's face. So after learning about the existential danger of Queen Esther and her people, her nation, the king, verse seven says, went into the palace garden. And most likely to consider what is to be done, what should be done to save Esther and the Jews from Haman's plot. It must have dawned on him that he was partly responsible for this deadly dilemma. After all, he had gone along with the whole thing, you remember in chapter three, and without much thought which wouldn't surprise anyone since mighty Ahasuerus was easily manipulated. I mean, every time he shows up in this story, he's being manipulated by somebody. He never makes a decision on his own. You notice that? Rather, it's always his advisors who are making decisions for him, whether they're decisions about the empire or decisions about his wife. And so understandably, when Haman fed him with lies about the Jews and he offered him that big bribe, he gladly complied, giving the official authorization to annihilate these pesky people whom he didn't know then were the very people of his new queen. Well, now that he does know, the king is in a real pickle here. Because as we saw in chapter one, verse 19, The decrees of the kings could not be repealed according to the laws of the Persians and the Medes. But even if he could repeal it, it would do him no good. After all, he is just as much to blame. And so to harm Haman, he would have to charge him with the very crime that he himself had committed. So what to do? Still unsure, the king, it says, returned from the palace garden to the feast only to find his answer staring him in the face. It just so happened that when he walked in, what did he find but Haman falling on the couch of the queen? We know from extra biblical sources that no man was allowed within seven paces of any woman who belonged to the king's harem, especially the queen. And so that was it. All the king needed to do away with Haman while saving face himself. Now, of course, Haman wasn't assaulting the queen as the king cleverly charged. He was begging for his life, but Ahasuerus wasn't gonna let this chance go by, this lucky turn of events, which we know, again, is another example of God's providence. Now, how might the king get rid of Haman quickly and conveniently? Well, verse nine to 10, Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. You really can't make this stuff up. It couldn't have gone more perfectly than this. The conceited character, who you remember, is completely obsessed with being elevated above everyone else, was finally elevated over the whole city. 50 cubits high on a giant wooden execution spike, which he had prepared for the very man the king honored instead of him in chapter 6 a remarkable reversal of fortunes. Both men finally getting what they deserved. Actually, when Haman was destroyed, the whole wicked nation that he represented, 
finally received the judgment they deserved. According to God's curse, you'll remember in Exodus 17. Hundreds of years had passed since the Amalekites had attacked God's people. And remember, when Saul had the chance to destroy them, he had failed in 1 Samuel 15. But now, after all those years, justice had prevailed. And by God's providence, it happened in the most fitting way. Haman the Agagite impaled on his own stake. Poetic justice, strikingly on display. Just like we heard earlier from Psalm 7, 14 to 16. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull, his violence descends. Church, when God's people long for justice in this often godless world, God is there. So often exposing the secret deeds and devices of the wicked, laying low the haughty, and bringing justice and judgment upon those who plan and perpetrate evil in this world, especially all who maliciously malign, mistreat, and molest God's covenant people. Just as God promised Abraham and all of his descendants in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. However, the same justice can be generally expected for all people everywhere because this is how God designed the world to work, that justice would be served through human courts, corrective circumstances, and God's own providence. For whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fail, Proverbs 22, 8, which is really a perfect summary of Haman's life that gives us hope as well today. When sinners scheme, when the proud plot, when the wicked have their way, using and abusing the helpless, opposing and oppressing the weak, ruining lives and taking lives for their own selfish gain, we know justice will be served. The wicked will reap what they sow. A reoccurring fact of history. In the 1920s, Al Capone was considered to be public enemy number one. Guilty of bribery, racketeering, gambling, prostitution, bootlegging, narcotics, robbery, and murder. He ruled an empire of crime that the authorities seemed they could not touch. But eventually, and inevitably, just as we would expect, his crimes finally caught up with him. And Capone was convicted in 1931, ending up in Alcatraz where he served eight years before being released due to severe syphilis he was suffering from and, and died of shortly after. Reflecting on his own Haman-like fall from greatness, Capone told one of his cellmates, I'm supposed to be a big shot and I've wound up in the shoe shop referring to the work he was given to do in prison. What kind of screwed up, lousy world is this, he complained. Of course, we know the opposite is true. When justice is served and the wicked reap what they sow, it demonstrates that things are going exactly as they should. Something that we should be thankful for every time we see justice in this world. Yet things don't always go as they should, do they? No, at times, justice isn't served. The wicked prosper, guilty men go free, and evil increases without restraint. What then? Well, it's then that God's people, you and I, must remember that the same God who brought justice here to Haman and brings justice to countless people in countless places throughout history will bring about perfect justice in the end when Christ the King reigns.
Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Church, on that day, all of our longing for justice will be over. Because once and for all, justice will be served over all the earth by the only righteous one. Evil will end, every wrong will be righted, and we who believe in Christ and belong to Christ, who have been justified by faith, will experience a world without any injustice forevermore. In God's kingdom, where nothing unclean will ever enter, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. While justice waves her vengeful hand, tremendous or a guilty land, almighty God, thy awful power, with fear and trembling, we will adore. Let's thank God for that hope of final justice that we can look forward to. Lord, this is again an incredible story as we see the tables turned on wicked Haman and that the Jews are finally seeing justice served on their enemy. And it reminds us, Lord, it reminds us that you have designed this world to function with justice. And that even though our world is fallen, so often, nevertheless, by your grace and your goodness, justice does prevail. Through human courts, through circumstances that correct injustice, and through your own providence, as we see in this story. And we're thankful for that. And yet, so much more, we're thankful for the day when King Jesus returns and brings about perfect justice on this earth. Thank you that through faith in him we are justified so that we do not need to fear experiencing that justice and judgment on ourselves because we know it already fell on him who died for us. And so we can have hope, hope of that day where perfect justice and righteousness will prevail on this earth. Lord, may we live each day in light of that hope as we long for justice in this world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.